welcome back to the Wellness Paradox podcast. I'm so grateful that you can join us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomena I call the wellness paradox. This paradox, as I view it, is the trust, interaction, and communication gap that exists between fitness professionals and our medical community. This podcast is all about closing off that gap by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences. And to do that in episode 92, we're going to piggyback off episode 91 two weeks ago with Dr. Signorelli, where we talked about power training for the aging adult. And we're going to talk about the opportunity that exists for fitness professionals and the fitness industry with the aging population in America. Any information I'd like to share with you from today's episode can be found on the show notes page. That's by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode nine two. So let's get into this discussion here. And this is largely referred to as the grain of America phenomena. And you could also probably argue that this is the, the grain of the world phenomena because the world as a whole is getting older. In fact, here in the United States, by the year 2035, there's going to be more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 18. I'll say that again, more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 18. We are simply growing older as a population. And that's very much thanks to the marvel that is modern medicine. Modern medicine is simply allowing us to live longer lives. The challenge is it may not be allowing us to live better lives per se. You know, indeed, just because we're living longer doesn't necessarily mean we're living better. With that said, over 80% of people who are over the age of 65 have one chronic disease, and over 68% of people over the age of 65 have two chronic diseases. So clearly, the chronic disease element of the aging population is a very, very real consideration. And since many of these chronic diseases are lifestyle in nature, particularly lifestyle in nature that involve physical activity, this is an area where I think fitness professionals have a great opportunity to be intervening with a population that is either underserved in some cases or not served at all in others. And I really think that this opportunity is something that if we can crystallize around it and we can have some type of a game plan towards, we not only have the ability to open ourselves up to a completely new market of individuals that we're not serving or barely serving right now, but I also think we have the opportunity to dramatically improve population health in a way that integrates us into the healthcare continuum. And we're going to get into that in a second, but let's first understand the implications of the grain of America and this chronic disease state that exists with the elderly. First, certainly increase healthcare cost. We know that the cost of you know, chronic diseases in this country um, is well over 90% of our healthcare cost. And as we get older and older and older, we're going to see simply a larger spend on chronic disease related healthcare cost. Certainly, as people age, uh, their goal is to maintain functional independence and autonomy as long as possible. But the more chronic diseases, particularly in the more end stage chronic diseases that exist, think of something like you know, diabetes with retinopathy or neuropathy, where you're having vision issues, you're having foot issues and gait issues, that certainly reduces quality of life and functional capacity and really kind of causes the, the walls to start to close in on you. So uh, that coexists with this interesting phenomena in America, um, which this is kind of unique to the structure of the American healthcare system, is that individuals over the age of 65 are covered by a single payer. Uh, that is, they are covered by the federal government. They are covered through uh, the entitlement program referred to as Medicare. So Medicare is the insurance program that individuals you know, 
pay into throughout the course of their life that by the time they hit 65, uh, they then receive medical care covered by the government. Now, we don't need to get into the history of Medicare for the purposes of this conversation, but it's important to note that because most health insurance in America is tied to employment, by the time someone reaches an age where they leave the workforce, you need to somehow backstop that health insurance that they were getting from their employer through some type of other entity. And that entity here in America is the federal government. So this is a really interesting opportunity, as I say, for fitness professionals to become part of the healthcare continuum. So the goal of this conversation is to help all of you understand the Medicare opportunity, but I want to go a step further from the conversation we had two weeks ago with Dr. Signorelli, where we talked about kind of general power training with the, the aging adult, and I want to get into some really granular programmatic variables. I received some emails following the podcast that said, hey, great conversation, and be great if you could talk about how we can integrate these into more of a holistic program with an aging adult population. So we're going to get into that, and we're also going to talk about how to operationalize this into a fitness business, because I think that's such a critical element to discuss in this conversation. It's not just what you should do, but how you should do it in order to monetize it in a way that's sustainable in a fitness business. So first off, let's let's talk about Medicare. And you know, the opportunity with Medicare is largely around the fact that there is this one single payer. Uh, that doesn't exist in the rest of American healthcare for the most part. In general, the vast majority of the population in America is covered by private health insurance that's associated with their employer. So that means there are hundreds of disparate insurers in the country that negotiate different payment systems with providers that cover different types of services that have different types of plans. Even the marketplace plans associated with the uh, ACA, even those plans can vary pretty widely. So when we talk about getting insurance coverage for fitness services, we talk about integrating in with healthcare, sometimes that could be a, a relatively challenging process given the complexity of the payer mix that exists here in the United States. But when we talk about Medicare, again, we talk about one payer, the government. So if we could start to develop programs that would be things that Medicare would not only be open to looking at, but potentially open to funding, then I think we have a great opportunity to actually become a reimbursable type of service at least within the, the Medicare umbrella. Now, that's not necessarily where this conversation is going to go because I, I think we're a long way away from actually getting that reimbursement from Medicare, uh, largely at this point, as we're going to talk about in a second, because Medicare is uh, under some serious financial strain and political strife right now. So I, I don't think now is the time for us to be marching on Washington, D.C., saying fitness services need to be reimbursed by Medicare. What this conversation is going to talk about is, is what we need to do to produce consistent outcomes with that aging adult population to set us up for the possibility that we would be able to get Medicare reimbursement at some point for our services. So let's put a pin on that. Let's just touch on the Medicare opportunity that generally speaking exists. Uh, for the most part, Medicare, again, because it is single payer funded by the government and because that's funded through tax dollars and there's a lot of scrutiny that exists under Medicare, uh, Medicare is very interested in how they transition to being more of a value-based care system. So in this country, for the most part, in the private payer system, we have largely what is referred to as a volume-based care. Essentially, the more care you do, the more money that you're paid for that care. Uh, so there's not a lot of incentive necessarily to provide better care. It's just the general incentive to provide a greater quantity of care because that's what's financially incentivized in the system. But Medicare, because they can look at all their expenses on one ledger, they're starting to realize, wow, we need to transition away from 
volume-based care to value-based care as quickly as we possibly can. Now, not that the private payer system is not thinking of these things as well. Uh, there's just a little less financial incentive, at least as this point at this point for them to do so. So Medicare is thinking, how do we improve the value of the care we provide? That is, we can provide better care, more efficient care at a lower price. And this shift from paying for volume to paying for value has been underway in Medicare for years. And if you think about what we provide as fitness professionals that can improve strength, that can improve power, that can maintain muscle mass, that can improve cardiometabolic health, these are all things that will result in better health outcomes for the aging adult population and will result in a lower Medicare spend. Now, this is also interesting because Medicare is a political flashpoint right now. If you're paying any attention to the news and what's happening in Washington, D.C., and the fight over the debt limit and these conversations around entitlement programs, uh, you're certainly hearing that you know, Medicare maybe isn't on the chopping block, uh, but it's certainly uh, uh, under the microscope for analysis at this point. So this, this political flashpoint is only going to continue to be a political flashpoint for years and years to come. At this point, according to the Congressional Budget Office, uh, by the year 2028, Medicare will be insolvent. That is, it will be bankrupt. It will not be able to pay for itself. Now, do I believe Medicare is going away in 2028? I absolutely don't believe that's the case. In fact, uh, the Biden administration has just recently released as a part of their, their budget plan, uh, a structure to uh, ensure Medicare solvency through 2050, which, that's a good thing. That's certainly we're gaining 22 years on the plan. But from my perspective, that just kicks the can down the road because by 2050, we're going to have to come up with another series of interventions to maintain solvency to Medicare. And by 2050, our population is going to be even living longer than what it is right now. It may not be living better, but it's certainly going to be living longer. So I really think there's this opportunity for evidence-based programmings to improve the holistic health of the aging adult and the Medicare population. It is a huge opportunity for our industry, and it's an opportunity our industry is, as a whole, missing right now. If you look at data from URSA, URSA put out their 2022 consumer survey here uh, recently. They found that only one third of gym goers are baby boomers or older. So only one third of the fitness and health club population in America are baby boomers or older. So the Medicare population effectively. When you think about that number of one third, you can't just think of that in terms of one third of Americans are that are baby boomers or older are going to gyms and fitness centers. You have to think of that as one third of the 20 percent that is going to fitness centers in this country. So we're talking about a very, very, very small percentage, infinitesimally small percentage of our senior population that is going to health and fitness clubs. And this is such an opportunity for us. So before I get into the nuts and bolts of programming for this population, because I think that, that that has to be part of this conversation, again, it was some of the, the email feedback that I received after the last podcast episode was, hey, you know, put this into a plan for us so we can operationalize this into our business. The first thing I want to talk about is just generally speaking, maybe how we need to orient ourselves when we're thinking about serving this population. And there's lots of ways to enter into this discussion. I'm going to start broad and then I'll get a little bit more granular before we get into programming. From a broad perspective, I think the first thing we need to do is just acknowledge the fact that this is a population that we need to be focusing on and we need to be messaging some way, somehow. If you think about the aging adult population, the, the Medicare population, the over 65 population. This is the last generation, for the most part, who has pensions. Uh, a lot of people in this generation have time. They have disposable income in a lot of cases. So this is a very viable market for us to be orientating ourselves towards. So I think that's the first point that we have to realize is that this market exists. They have the funds 
they have the time. And again, they're underserved or not served at all by our industry, by and large. Again, there are some entities that serve this population. The, the one that most readily comes to mind is the Silver Sneakers program. Silver Sneakers has been around for decades. Um, they have a structure for membership. They have classes. But if I think about, broadly speaking, the industry as a whole, that's the singular entity that is focused almost you know, just monolithically on this aging population over time. And that obviously is proven to be woefully inadequate in terms of the demand that could exist in this population. Again, we go back to that statistic that only you know one third of fitness consumers are baby boomers or older. Clearly, there's an opportunity to provide more service here that our industry simply isn't doing right now. So we need to think of how we message and how we market to this population. So I, I would ask you, in, in whatever type of fitness business you're in, you could be a, a solopreneur in your own business, you could own your own boutique studio, you might be a personal trainer or fitness instructor in, in a larger big box commercial club, but in all those environments, how are we messaging this population? You know, what's the language we're using around this population? It, this can't be the get your beach bod or get ready for summer or get your six pack type of messaging our industry's used to using. This needs to be messaging that's largely based around functional capacity, independence, strength, health, you know, whatever synonym you want to use here. Um, this is not a conversation around aesthetics. This is decidedly a conversation around functional capacity, autonomy, and independence. Ultimately, that's what people care about as they age. They care about their ability to maintain independence. How long can I live doing things the way that I want to do them, and doing them in a place that I want to do them, not being constrained by my physical limitations. So the shift in languaging, language is so important for this population. We, we can't be talking about the things we traditionally talk about in our industry if we're going to look to accommodate this population. We also have to think in terms of imagery. I mean, you've heard me talk about this before with many different topics around how we market and promote our industry. But if you are looking to get an aging adult to exercise in your facility or with you, the imagery that you're using to market yourself needs to reflect the, the look of that aging adult population. We can't have imagery that is only a bunch of fifth, 35 or 40 year olds. This needs to be imagery that reflects a broad array of body shapes and sizes that are older. And I realize that could be hard through just stock imagery and things that you might find online. So this is probably something where if, if you're going to find the imagery that you're looking for for this, you very well may have to create it yourself with your own clients or members of your own family or in, in your own community. And these can be ways that we look at attracting this population. I think there's a great opportunity if we message the right way, if we use the right imagery to start to attract these people. And again, uh, the aging adult is, is yearning for maintaining their functional independence and their functional capacity. That, that is something they're looking for. And we are not providing it as an industry. And the irony is that as an industry, because of what we're going to talk about in a second, we are among the best suited groups to ensure that this in group of individuals maintains their independence and their functional capacity over time because we are the group that improves strength, power, helps to maintain muscle mass, all of which are critical to functional independence as people age. So I want to start to dive a little bit deeper into this conversation around programming for these individuals. Again, two weeks ago, we talked about the need to develop power for this population, but I want to build on that concept into more holistic program design today. But before I get into this, I do have to note some important considerations to working with the aging adult population. 
First off, it is critical to understand their medical history and their chronic conditions. As we established earlier, over 68% of this population has at least two chronic conditions. Those chronic conditions are going to come with limitations, restrictions, contraindications. Uh, they're going to come with some guardrails on exercise intensity and complexity. Uh, in many cases, they're going to come with medications that have interactions with exercise and the things that we might do from an interventional standpoint with this population. So please be keenly aware of this individual's medical history and when appropriate, seek medical clearance from their physician. Uh, we're actually gonna talk about the role of physicians play uh, a little bit later on in this conversation, but getting medical clearance per the American College of Sport Medicine's pre-participation screening guidelines is absolutely critical. In fact, we'll link up to those pre-participation screening guidelines in the show notes page, just to make sure all of you have them. Getting medical clearance when warranted for this population is a way to ensure that not only is exercise safe and effective, uh, but also it's a great way to develop a relationship with primary care physicians that work with this population that too are looking for an avenue to help ensure that their patients maintain their functional independence as they age. So those are critically important considerations and after you've sought that medical clearance for this population, you know, when and if necessary, very, very important to make sure that we establish where they're at at baseline, not just from a fitness perspective, but also from a cognitive and from a motor skill perspective. Uh, we do have to realize as people age that cognitive decline is just simply a reality. And, and I'm not talking about clinical levels uh, of clock cognitive decline like dementia. I'm just talking about the standard cognitive decline that exists with age. Now, certainly as if someone is cognitively declining to the point of dementia or Alzheimer's or some of these other type of age-related uh, cognitive disorders, we definitely need to be acutely aware of that. But even just the, the general forgetfulness, uh, the inability to possibly hear well, the inability to see well, all of these are things that have to be taken into consideration and assessed at baseline to ensure that we not only develop a program that is safe, but also one that is effective in its structure and its substance. Uh, doing a battery of tests initially, I think, can be critically helpful. We'll list this battery of tests on the show notes page, but posture tests, uh, a balance test, strength, power, and agility tests, uh, aerobic capacity testing, all these type of tests are great ways to be able to make sure we get a snapshot of that individual's functional capacity when they're starting their program with us to one, determine an appropriate starting point and a point to progress from, but two, to be able to measure change over time, which with any population we want to work with, particularly if we wanna become part of the healthcare continuum, we have to be thinking about the outcomes we're producing. And better yet, we have to be thinking about how to report those outcomes back to our clients, physicians, so they not only see what we're doing for them, but then they can use that as an information that they can then possibly consider referring other patients to us that are looking for a similar level of care. So when we think about programming for this population, uh, I think a couple of really important points to start the programming discussion. First is the notion of what's different with the aging population in terms of their responses to exercise. Uh, first off, we know that when people age, uh, they just have general deterioration of their vascular system for the most part. We see arthrosclerosis becoming a bigger concern as individuals age, hypertension becomes a bigger concern. We also see kind of the lack of venous compliance in this population. Uh, you'll see varicose veins, you'll get blood pooling in the lower extremities. Um, all of these are indications that we need a really, really robust warm-up and cool-down 
to these individuals' workouts. So whereas, you know, you and I, you know, those of you who listen to this podcast that are a little bit younger, you know, we could probably hop in the gym, start our workout with a very short warm-up, if any warm-up at all, and then maybe no cool down at all at the end of the workout. These are individuals that will need an extended warm-up or cool down period. And that just needs to get built into the workout. That needs to be something that probably is, you know, 10 minutes long on both ends of the workout. I realize that adds 20 minutes of time to the workout that constrains what you can do during a, a typical training session. But the reality is the ability to get their cardiovascular system properly engaged in exercise and then properly cooled down from exercise is very, very important to the overall safety of the workout. So first and foremost, uh, definitely extended warm up and cool down period for these individuals. We also have to realize as people age, uh, their rates of recovery slow fairly significantly. Uh, we know that as people age, uh, rates of protein synthesis tend to slow down. There tends to be a general anabolic resistance that exists with people as they age. And so taking into consideration recovery is very, very important. May require longer times in between workouts to ensure an individual is adequately recovered, whereas we might take somebody in their mid to late 40s and we might have them train every day or every other day. Somebody who's over the age of 65, depending on their recovery profile, uh, they may take three or four days to recover in between certain types of workouts. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody over the age of 65 shouldn't be physically active every day, but we may have to be very, very focused on how often we provide them a high intensity exercise stimulus uh, versus an exercise stimulus that's a little bit lower intensity. So maybe I'm having somebody do cardiovascular exercise at a low to moderate intensity um, on multiple days in a row, but I'm every third day having them do a strength training workout that may be a little bit more strenuous, that may take a little bit more time to recover. Now, the other thing, and we're going to talk about this when we get into uh, the programming discussion, and Dr. Signorelli talked about it two weeks ago in episode 91, is that as people age, we see a deterioration in the velocity at which their muscles can contract. So this, this reduction in uh, contraction velocity that exists with age, um, this is the most prominent uh, musculoskeletal feature of the aging process. We tend to see power or velocity of contraction uh, deteriorate faster than strength and then faster than muscle mass. In fact, when you look at the muscular degradation that is associated with the aging process, it is velocity of contraction that reduces first, strength that reduces second, and then muscle mass that reduces third. That, that's kind of the hierarchy of the diminishing returns from a muscular standpoint as we age. So we have to bear that in mind with the exercises we're selecting, the speed of movement that we're choosing, and, and how we progress somebody to you know, functionally movements that are a little bit faster. So again, I, I think those are important considerations. We're getting impaired recovery. We're getting impaired um, rates of force development as individuals age. And those are just considerations that need to be taken in to program design when you're thinking about how we work with this population. I'd like to take a quick break from today's episode to tell you a little something about one of our sponsors. As all of you are well aware, addressing the wellness paradox is a lifelong passion project for me. And when you're going to go on a long journey, it's difficult to go it alone. You need to find like-minded individuals that are willing to go on that crusade with you. And that's exactly what I found at the MRF Institute. The team over at the MRF Institute creates educational content for fitness and wellness professionals who are serious about becoming a part of our healthcare continuum. Getting on the healthcare continuum is all about leveling up our skills to be looked at as that valued resource provider. The wellness paradox is certainly an avenue for you to do that, but we need many different levers to pull if we're going to get there. And the MRF Institute is definitely one of those levers. You can go to their website, mrfinstitute.org, to find all kinds of great, informative, free informational content. And if you choose to engage with any of their paid content, they've created a coupon code specifically for Wellness Paradox listeners. You can enter in WP 
2022, that's WP, and then the number 2022 to the website at checkout to receive a 15% discount on your purchase. I highly recommend you go check out mrfinstitute.org. Now back to today's episode. Now, when we start to get into the nuts and bolts, I will assert that muscular fitness needs to be the primary emphasis of the aging adult population. And in fact, I would assert that it is the rate limiter to cardiovascular fitness and cardiovascular exercise. And if you think of it from the perspective of in order to stress your heart, your lungs, and your blood vessels, that is to improve your cardiovascular fitness, you need to have enough muscular strength to be able to get up out of the chair and enough muscular power to be able to walk fast enough down the street to actually stress your heart on a high enough level. That is to increase your heart rate on a high enough level to actually be able to derive a cardiovascular benefit. So saying that, I think our programs for the aging adult population need to be disproportionately focused on muscular fitness. And so when we think about improving muscular fitness, uh, the three areas for us to think about, there is the amount of muscle mass, the amount of force that a muscle can produce, so that is the strength, and the amount of force that could be produced at speed, that is power. And again, that's what we talked about a couple of weeks ago with Dr. Signorelli. But where I want to fill in the, the gaps from that conversation with Dr. Signorelli uh, really are around how we get there, what the progression looks like. And when I think of progression with the aging adult population, the first thing we have to take into consideration is that chronological age and biological age are a very, very different thing. Uh, certainly some individuals who are 65 have a fitness level and a functional capacity or, or a, what I would consider to be their biological age in their 40s. There are other people that are in their 60s who have a biological and a functional age in their 80s. So we can't treat every 68-year-old like the same type of a person from a functional capacity standpoint. So I, I think that that's where that baseline series of assessments that we talked about becomes a really, really important part of the conversation is, you know, how do we actually assess where this person is at functionally and biologically? Uh, but after we've assessed that, when we start to think of how we design a program, uh, I want to think in terms of what we refer to as a periodization model. And some of you that are listening are probably familiar with periodization, uh, periodization being the kind of progressive increase in intensity over time uh, by manipulating the training parameters in a workout. And when I talk about intensity, I'm largely talking about load here, uh, but I wouldn't even extend that type of a, of a conversation with the aging adult population to be not just load, uh, but also the velocity of movement. So when I think about periodizing for the aging adult population, the first thing I think about is how do I enter this population into strength training in a way that is safe and effective? And to do that, I would consider something that I refer to as kind of a foundational or anatomical adaptation phase of training. Uh, this is a period of time that is relatively low from a volume perspective. It's low from an intensity perspective. It's uh, diminished from a frequency perspective. It is a way to introduce the rigors of strength training to the aging adult body in a way that causes the body to be able to recover and adapt effectively between training sessions. So when I think of a workout like this, I'm generally thinking of one exercise for all of the major muscle groups of the body. So we'll lump legs in as one category, uh, then back, chest, shoulders, triceps, biceps, and we'll just kind of generally call it core uh, for the other category. And when I'm doing one exercise for all of these major muscles, I'm probably doing two, maybe three sets per exercise max. Try to be using about 10 to 15 repetitions per set. That's normally a good rep range to start um, an individual in that hasn't strength trained before. But 
I'm selecting loads that they probably can do 15 to 20 times. And so this, this concept of selecting a load that's different from the rep range that I'm using is the concept of reps in reserve, meaning how many reps do you have left in the tank at the end of your set? And in an anatomical or foundational adaptation phase for the aging adult, I'm probably going to want to have three to five reps left in the tank at the end of the set, if not even a couple more uh, when somebody's starting their training. So that means I'm never going to failure. And I'm at, in fact, I'm doing everything that I can to stay, you know, at least three, if not five reps away from that failure point. Now, this can be accomplished by being very, very conscious of the loads. It can also be accomplished by being very, very conscious of the rest intervals. So when we kind of intersect load and rest interval, if you find a load that's appropriate for set number one, let's say of three sets, and you have an appropriate rest interval between sets, odds are you're going to be able to maintain that load with that three to five rep left in reserve for hopefully both sets or all three sets, depending on what your prescription scheme looks like. So I like rest intervals for the age and adult population that are around 90 seconds to two minutes per set. Now, it may have to be a little bit longer depending on how long it takes somebody to recover from set to set. Certainly an exercise like a squat is going to require a longer rest interval than an exercise like a bicep curl. Uh, but trying to maintain at least two to three sets per exercise for all the major muscle groups of the body, 10 to 15 reps per set with a load that you can do 15 to 20 repetitions with and taking about 90 to 120 seconds of rest between sets is a great way to start to introduce somebody to strength training. And they may, they may need to be on that type of a training phase for two or three months before they're really appropriately adapted to strength training. Uh, typically, the frequency of these workouts are going to be about twice a week. I like to spread them out by anywhere around 72 to 96 hours so I give them adequate recovery time in between workouts. After I feel like they've adapted well to that type of a training phase and I feel like their training responses are fairly stable, the workouts aren't necessarily easy, but they're also not necessarily hard. So maybe on an RP scale of one to 10 with 10 being the hardest. Maybe when you start a series of foundational or anatomical adaptation workouts, they're going to say workouts are an eight, a nine, or a 10. Once they start to get down to about a, a four to a five, then I can start to think, okay, it's time to progress this individual through the different training phases that emphasize hypertrophy, uh, at least to the standpoint that it allows them to focus on maintaining, if not building a little bit of muscle mass, strength, and then finally power. So let's just assume for a second, and we'll kind of try to put this into a practical context, that I have somebody that goes through three months of anatomical or, or foundational adaptation. They do this training phase that I just mentioned. Then I enter into month four, and I want to start to progress the loads heavier and I actually may be taking the volume down in some cases, or I might be maintaining it the same. It just really depends as to what volume I achieved when I was in that, that earlier anatomical adaptation phase. But if I wanted to progress this individual into more of what we would call a hypertrophy phase, I would keep them likely in the 10 to 15 rep range, but I would first drop the rest interval to 60 to 90 seconds between set instead of 90 to 120 seconds. And I would see if that allows me to accumulate a little bit more volume in my sessions. You know, maybe instead of doing two sets per exercise, I could do three. Or instead of doing one exercise for the big muscles like legs, back, and chest, I'm able to do two exercises. So the first thing I would do by dropping the rest intervals is I would simply increase the volume if I was focusing on a phase that was primarily um, muscle growth in nature. And then after I've done that, then I would start to close off that rep and reserve gap. So I take it from the three to five that it was in an anatomical adaptation phase, and then I would start to scale that back 
to maybe one to three repetitions in more of a traditional hypertrophy phase. Now, I'd probably keep this individual in that phase for one to two months. And then after I see that they're tolerating that well, then I would progress them again into a strength phase. So here in this phase, I'd be taking the repetitions down. I might drop them from the 10 to 15 rep range down to the six to 10 rep rep range with a corresponding increase in load. Now, again, I still wouldn't want to be training a failure here, but I probably would take them into the six to 10 rep rep range with a load I can do eight to 12 reps with, trying to maintain anywhere between about one to three reps left in reserve. Now, the trick here is that I want to make sure that the rest intervals are long enough to facilitate the adaptations that I'm looking for. So in this case, I might be resting two to three minutes in between sets, which of course might result in your volume going down a little bit for these workouts because you may only have so much work you can get done in a period of time. Then finally, after I see that they've tolerated that type of a strength phase well, again, I'm, I'm six to 10 reps per set, I'm two, two and a half minutes in between my sets, then I would progress them one step further to a power phase. And this is what we were talking about with Dr. Signorelli last episode, is that this is a phase where I would go with the six to 10 rep rep range. I'd keep the rest interval two to two and a half minutes between sets, but I would reduce the loads such that they might be able to do 12 to 20 reps per set with a load they're only gonna do six to 10 times but I would encourage them to produce their movement at the highest amount of velocity possible. So their, their movement should emphasize speed more so than anything else. And again, this is what we talked about back in episode 91. So I've got this progression from a, a high rep, low intensity, kind of low to moderate volume foundational or anatomical adaptation phase into a hypertrophy phase where I'm trying to accumulate more volume. I'm trying to get a little bit closer to momentary muscle failure, but not quite achieving it. And then I'm progressing into a phase with lower reps, longer rest intervals, higher loads to improve strength. And then I'm progressing again into a phase that is lower reps, longer rest, and lower loads with the goal of moving at maximum velocity for all of those lifts. So that's a general programmatic structure and periodization structure for working with the aging adult. Uh, I will say that uh, several go-to exercises that I like to use for this population are the structural movements, so squats, deadlifts, bent over rows, standing overhead presses. Uh, those are some of my favorite movements to focus on with this population because they really focus on you know, what I consider to be some of the, the core functional strengthening needs of the age and adult. As far as core work goes, I love any core work that gets somebody new extension. So something like a Superman, uh, a pelvic lift or a pelvic bridge, uh, planks, side planks to train the transverse abdominis, internal obliques, quadratus lumborum, all those muscles that are so critical to stabilizing the pelvis and the lumbar spine, all are critical exercises. Uh, lastly, I do like exercises that train the tibialis anterior, uh, particularly anything that trains the dorsiflexors uh, of the ankle at some higher rate of speed, have that be a band tied around the ankle um, or the foot and dorsiflexing rapidly. I find that is a great way to ensure that we maintain uh, strength and power in a muscle that is very, very much related to falls with the elderly. So that's a lot. That's a lot of information. And I, I highly encourage you to go back and you know listen to that again and you know take down some notes to make sure you've got your head wrapped around it. Uh, we'll provide some resources on the show notes page that summarize all of those. Uh, but before I let you go, I, I do want to talk about the last component of this, which is you know how we truly engage with the, the community that supports the aging adults. So if you think about you know, primary care physicians that work with the aging adult population, you think of you know, community centers, 
that work with this population, uh, church groups and faith-based groups that are engaging uh, with the aging adult population. Certainly senior homes and retirement communities are something that are engaged with this population a lot. These are the people that we should be going to and saying, hey, I work with the aging adult population and I have something valuable to provide. Here's my program. And if you could develop a program, and this is where I think the rubber meets the road for operationalizing this into your business, you can develop a, a eight week, a 12 week, a 16 week, you know, stay well type of aging adult program where you say, I'm going to conduct a series of tests at baseline. I'm going to conduct a series of tests when I'm done with the program. And we're going to meet two to three days a week uh, during that eight to 16 week period of time. Maybe it's individuals, maybe it's group. Uh, that's a conversation that you'll have to decide in terms of what's best for your business. Group is always a little bit more desirable because it allows you to help more people and it allows you to keep the cost per participant down. But if you can develop a program and if you could show efficacy of that program based on the outcome data that you're tracking, that is something that you could sell not only to the aging adult, but also all these communities that engage with the aging adult, the face-based communities, the primary care physicians that work with the aging adult, community centers, uh, the, uh, the, the centers that you know individuals engage with at this point in their life, uh, the retirement communities, they're looking for this type of service. They don't have this kind of service. And if you could provide it to them in a pre-packaged way that actually shows good tangible outcome measures, then you have a decided advantage over your competition. And you're opening yourself up to a market, again, that is underserved or not served at all. And I think that that is the opportunity that exists here with the grain of America is we have this opportunity to provide highly valuable services to a population that desperately needs it, that is not getting it right now. And, and that's the conversation that I really wanted to have today. There's substantial opportunity. Right now, there's a business opportunity for private pay, direct cash pay programs that help aging adults maintain their functional independence. That exists today. What I believe will exist in the future, because it has to exist in order for Medicare to remain solvent as our population uh, continually gets older and older, is that fitness professionals are actually part of the multidisciplinary care team that is working with the aging adult population. And the only way we're gonna to get to that point is if we start to develop the programs and the experience of working with the aging adult population right now. So that is the challenge that I put forth to all of you is you know, be competent working with these populations, learn the things that you need to work with them safely and effectively, develop the right programs, develop the right relationships, and then reap the benefits in the future, not only monetarily, because you've offered service to an entirely underserved market, but also we'll be able to reap the benefits from an overall public health perspective as our population ages. A lot of stuff to think about there, a lot of stuff to consider, but I think a great opportunity that I wanted to put out there for all of you any additional information that I'd like to share from this episode will be found on the show notes page. That's by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode 92. If you found this information insightful or informative, please do share with your friends and colleagues. Those shares make a massive difference for us. Please be on the lookout for next week's episode when it drops in two weeks. And don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Until we chat again next, please be well.